Welcome everyone, it's Andrew Beach, Executive Career Coach. I'm a teacher of self-education. I help professionals like you communicate your value to find great opportunities faster, and that's whether you're working or not. Today is Career Happy Hour. It's FAQ Friday. Whatever you want to call it, it's free coaching for you. We're continuing our book club discussion. If you're interested in procuring the book that we're reading um, today, you can actually do that in the um, description below. There's a book. It's called The National Business Employment Weekly Book on Networking. It's actually one of my favorite books uh, for networking. I know there's plenty of books out there that talk about why we should network. Very few tell you how to network specifically for job search. And this is actually one of the better ones that I can think of that it's available for you to take advantage of. So go ahead and do that. If you could do me a quick favor, let me know in the chat where you're joining from and click the share button. I'd like to get other people involved in our discussions today because we know intuitively the number one way to find work today is networking. And I wanna advocate that and talk about that. I want you all interacting in the chat in that way and connecting with others. In fact, let me know what job titles are you seeking? That's something that would be valuable, whether you're on Periscope, YouTube, uh, Facebook in my group. Um, there's a group there in Facebook. And then I also am broadcasting live here on LinkedIn, which is where most of you are probably joining from. So let's go ahead and uh, go ahead and share this particular session. And then we're going to get into the book. Uh, until then, let me know what questions you have. Uh, I can answer some of those now, or I can answer them certainly at the end of the session. Either way, good to have you, Karar, from Kirkland. Wonderful. Good to have you. Had a lot of interesting things happen this week. Um, many clients um, frustrated and uh, processing emotions. Uh, so this is happy hour, right? It's Friday. We made it through the week, and hopefully we can make it through next week a little more positively. So let's put our emotions to rest and focus on self-development today. So we're gonna jump into the book. If you have any questions, by all means, uh, put those in the chat. I'd be happy to answer you here in just a moment. But we're working on chapter four, and chapter four really covers, uh, so up until now we talked about um, what is networking. We also talked about developing your two minute drill or your introductory statement, and then identifying who will meet and why will they meet you? And today we're talking about actually asking for those meetings. So the progression in the book is actually rather logical um, and pragmatic. And that's what we want to advocate here, a logical, pragmatic process uh, to help all of us get better at the networking thing and find the opportunities that work well for us. So here on the screen, you'll see uh, you can put chat if you have any questions. And then over here, you can see um, there's kind of an agenda that aligns with the chapter that we're going to read in the book today. Now, obviously, this is broadcast to YouTube. Um, so if you want to come back at the end, I believe it's pages 67 to 83 that I'll be reading today. Um, and so let's hit it. Into the fray, asking for meetings. It's time to begin. You're ready to start asking others for help. That thought drives a lot of job seekers crazy particularly high achievers who have well-developed egos. You're about to hit on a whole card file full of people for favors to become beholden to most of them and to risk being scoffed at or patronized. You might even have to admit that you're not in complete control of your own destiny. That's hard to, hard to swallow for sure. The introverts among us, me included, by one measure, we're about 30% of the U.S. population don't particularly relish meeting strangers. Deep down in our psyche may be a notion that the world should come to us, seeking out our many virtues. To this population, networking is no different than other interpersonal grip and grin activities such as fundraising, greeting a political crowd, working the room at the Chamber of Commerce breakfast, or selling vinyl siding to widows. The primary reason most of us dislike asking for help is that it seems to involve giving power away. And whoever gets enough 
to give some away? The answer is, we all do. Throughout history, many effective statesmen, Ben Franklin comes to mind, knew and practiced a very basic principle of human nature. The more power you give away, the more you have. It's when you try to take power that people have an incentive to give you a tough time. Keeping it all in perspective. The key to networking success and to avoiding a major case of networking negativism lies in understanding that you aren't asking for a giant favor that creates a giant debt and gives others leverage over you. On the contrary, skillful networking is low key, low intensity, low stakes, low demand, and low risk to both parties. You're subtly empowering the other party while not asking for much in return. That's an irresistible bargain for most people. Behind every request for network meeting, whether it's with friends, business contacts, or some member of the great and powerful, is a simple but essential bargain. We can paraphrase it in we can paraphrase it this way. If you will give me an extremely minuscule portion of your precious time and wondrous expertise, I will guarantee you the satisfaction of having helped another human being and of having created some small measure of indebtedness on my part. You won't actually say it that way, but this is the underlying contract of a properly handled networking request. The bargain is pretty hard for most people to resist. The trick is to deliver on your promise without overworking the contact's genuine but limited willingness to help. We'll show you how to do that later. What are you asking for? Your contact's willingness to help you will depend in large measure on how your requests are couched. Networking requests are alarming. alarming. Uh, networking requests are alarming when they ask for too much time. Could you review my entire career reappraisal process with me? Or they ask for too much help. I wonder if you would be good enough to tell me what to do with my life. Or they are expressed in such lofty abstract or highfalutin language that the contact is bewildered or daunted. I wonder if we might schedule an informational interview in which we would prioritize my career development and job search objectives and discuss various viable vocational alternatives in light of existing economic and vocational realities. Don't do that. Or they are unpleasantly pushy or involve a bald-faced lie. I'll call you Thursday at 2 to schedule a meeting. We'll only need 10 minutes. I haven't seen any network meeting go 10 minutes. Keep your requests for help brief, conversational, and low-key. Be sincere in your use of words that emphasize the informality and relative brevity of the networking encounter. Ask if we might get together for a brief chat or if we could meet for a few minutes so I might get your thoughts and opinions about some job search ideas I've been mulling over. Ask if I might drop in on you at work for a few minutes and pick your brain. Tell someone, I'd be grateful if I could get your advice on how to get some exposure in the widget market. In short, keep it light. You can trigger just as much suspicion by asking for too little time as by asking for too much. Particularly among people who are experienced in networking, many reputed job search experts say to ask for 20 minute networking meeting. Unless your sole purpose is to fling a lot of verbiage in the, in the contact's face and bolt out of the room without any thoughtful discussion, you can't do a decent networking meeting in 20 minutes. It takes that long just to get warmed up, recite your two-minute drill, and respond to the contact's questions about your background, motives, objectives, and reason for being in the job market. A request for a 20-minute meeting, therefore, is naive insincere or a misrepresentation of how much of the contact's time you really intend to use. If both parties are focused and experienced networkers and are determined to cut to the chase with a minimal amount of small talks and extraneous meandering, a reasonably effective network meeting can be started, warmed up, played out, and completed 
in 40 to 45 minutes. But that's really moving along. The average networking meeting lasts about an hour and you shouldn't let it go longer unless, unless the contact sends out explicit signals that he wants it to continue. A 90 minute meeting is a long meeting. The possibilities are a lot of useful information is being exchanged. Both of you are really enjoying yourselves. You've gotten off on an unrelated topic or one of the other of you is lecturing, pontificating, or getting into enormous detail. If a meeting runs long for good reasons, it isn't necessarily bad. But be careful to keep tabs on why it's running long. If you detect yawns, time checks, drumming fingers, doodling, or other evidence of distraction, cut to the closing credits fast. How much should you be in someone's face? It's axiomatic in networking that you should try to get face-to-face -face meetings with contacts whenever possible. Body language experts agree that more than half of all the message content in an interpersonal transaction is conveyed non-verbally. Confidence, credibility, and authority can be communicated without a word being spoken. An image of a face leaves a more vivid memory trace than a letter or a voice on the phone. Whenever possible, meet people in person. How closely should you live by the I'd kill to get face-to-face -face meeting principle? If a potential contact suggests that you two network by phone, try to change their mind. You might say, it would probably work best if we could sit down together, Sandra, but if your schedule can't squeeze that in, so be it. I'd be grateful for your help any way I can get it. You may get the meeting if you keep pressing and don't take no for an answer, but <laughs> wear your lead BVDs because you're probably going to get roasted. <laughs> you not only hurt yourself if you come on like a snake oil peddler, but you spoil it for everyone else who may ever want to network with this contact. What about lunch? It's tempting to use business lunches for networking, particularly if you're employed, don't have much free time to schedule meetings, and or have to be fairly discreet when choosing where and how you get job market exposure. You can meet a variety of people over lunch without raising suspicion if your boss happens by, but you also gain a lot of weight and strain your budget to the breaking point. Any networking meeting is a favor to you, so you're usually obligated to repay the favor by offering to buy lunch. Polite folks might resist, and in some cases you may get away with going Dutch. But be prepared to reach for the check. If you do a lot of networking, and you should, the cost of feeding the flock can really add up. A sit-down lunch may be too long for a networking meeting, particularly if you're in a restaurant where the dining experience is an hour and a half. Once the networking agenda has been completed, see chapter five, time will start to hang heavy with a contact you hadn't known before and with whom you can't share residual gossip. So how are Marge and the kids? Over dessert and coffee. Finally, bear in mind that the bodily requirements of chewing and swallowing can get in the way of graceful give and take networking. You'll talk, leaving your poached salmon untouched as the contact munches self-consciously through his broccoli surprise. Eventually, he may conclude it's his turn to talk a while, at which time you must plow through your <laughs> chow at warp speed in order to catch up. If you decide to network over lunch, find eating places that serve small portions and select food that doesn't drool on you when you eat fast. Grilled chicken breast is fairly safe and splatter free. Look for interesting places to eat, meaning inexpensive. Because the networking meeting is a favor to you, agree to meet at the contact's convenience. Power breakfasts are coming on strong as an extension of the number of hours in a business day. A breakfast of half a grapefruit, a, toast, a toasted English muffin, and black coffee at 7 a.m. may be your contact's idea of a good get-together. If you're not an early riser, this regimen can really fry your biorhythms. It's more common for business people to go Dutch for breakfast than for lunch, but still be ready to reach for the check. Asking around in the association. In our discussion about developing your list of potential networking contacts, 
We paid a lot of attention to professional associations, community groups, fraternal organizations, and the like. They're fruitful fields for the serious networker, but watch out when you're, you're, you till those fields, landmines may be hidden in their rich soil. Most associations and professional groups are, at heart, designed to foster formal and informal exchange of information. They are, in a large measure, networking organizations. However, the collective good and professional interests of the entire membership are supposed to get top priority. Your personal job search or career development agenda shouldn't overshadow the collective purposes and activities of the association. Good point. Some of the most savage attacks on networking are coming, quite justifiably, from sincere members of organizations who are tired of seeing job seekers plunk down the membership fee, grab the membership list, and use the organization as nothing more than a private networking playground. The strength and viability of these organizations depend on the willingness of members to contribute, not just take. People who join such a networking group simply further their own interests are seen as hypocritical, self-serving, and manipula manipulative. Do it and you'll earn a bad reputation for yourself and for networking. You need not exclude such a group from your networking efforts if you are an active member, attend its conferences, and draw on its resources while participating actively in its agenda. Becoming a regular contributor and visible figure is a terrific way of marketing your skills and abilities. Volunteering your time may seem wasteful when you face the more fundamental priority of, working, of finding work, but remember a most fundamental networking axiom. What goes around comes around. The more you go around, the more chances you'll have for opportunities to come around. If you honestly don't have enough time to participate in the affairs of a group, you're thinking of joining, don't join. If your main purpose is to glom on to the membership roster, try to get it another way. Borrow a friend's copy and then try cold calling networking into the membership without using the subterfuge of feigned affiliation. Good point. Get the ball rolling. Enough preamble, it's time to do something. Take a deep breath. <sighs> Select the name of a friend or colleague from your proximity contact list and pick up the phone. Use this as a model for your part of the conversation. This is really good. I use this a lot, in fact. Uh, Beth, this is Leon. I was hoping I might be able to prevail on you for a little help. I don't know if you've heard that Minor Tech has been bought by Acquire All, but we all think our jobs are in serious danger and I want to begin to test the waters. I haven't had to run a job search in 15 years. Beth, and the thought of hitting the job market is, well, a little unsettling. I was wondering if I could sit down with you for 45 minutes to an hour for a networking type meeting. I promise you, I promise you, I'm not gonna hit you on you or your job or company for a job. And I don't expect that you'll magically know of available openings out there. I really would welcome the chance to pick your brain about what's happening in the artificial intelligence industry. At this point in my search, at this point in my search, it would be very helpful to me to be able to sit down with someone I know and am comfortable with and get some practice, practice describing my background, what I have to offer, and why I'm in the job market. I'd be happy to meet with you at any time, at your convenience, but since what I'm trying to show off here is my game face, show off my game face, it would be best if we could arrange to sit down at your office, at your office, rather than in a social setting. So we, we headed that thing off at the pass. That's a wonderful script, and you're welcome. If you get the book, you can, you can read it, but, I mean, play that back. Take what you can out of that. It's really good. If your, request, if your request strikes the proper balance between being low-key and being directive, chances are you'll get the networking meeting on your terms. With this script, you've subtly changed the stakes by letting the contact know that your request for help is slightly more structured and formal than your prior relationship might normally suggest. Other opening phrases can carry the same signal that a friend or acquaintance 
should listen with a more attentive ear. Bill, for once, I'm not calling to borrow your lawnmower. I wonder if I could prevail on you for a different kind of favor. Or, Janice, this may sound a little stilted, but I was hoping I could call on your friendship in a way I never have before. These openers may sound a little heavy, but they'll ensure that your request is chewed slowly and not swallowed too fast. Upping the ante. Sooner or later, you're going to ask for a networking meeting with someone you don't know. The lubrication of friendship and proximity will be absent. You may no longer use the icebreaker, I just want to practice to see if I can present a clear product profile. About this time, many job seekers develop a strong approach avoidance conflict and a simultaneous sudden interest in daytime TV. This is the time to suck it up and go for it. When you do and you find out how easy it is and how friendly most people are, which is true, you're going to wonder why you were so apprehensive. You'll pick up a pail you thought was full of water only to discover it's empty. Your energy will rise dramatically Rank cheerleading? No. An objective description of what scores of successful networks have reported. Once you're in, the water's fine. Call or write. A lively debate continues among networkers about whether the best approach is to phone or to write. Both techniques have their virtues. Judge what works best for you according to what makes you most comfortable or what is called for by the specific information you have about your contact. The beauty of calling is that if you can succeed in getting the prospective contact or power contact on the line, it's harder for him to ignore or deflect the request for help. An immediate response is called for and the, most, the one most frequently given is yes. The trick is to reach the contact without being screened out, put on indefinite hold, or shunted to the human resources department by a well-trained secretary who protects the boss from low-priority intrusions. A letter will usually get through and be read. The good introductory note can set up the stage for a follow-up phone call without the pressure of having to cut to the chase in the first few seconds. Hi, you don't know me, but... It can mention the name of the person who referred you, state why you want the networking meeting, and what the contact is supposed to know Provide a brief thumbnail sketch of your background and objectives, and if you like, serve as a low-pressure delivery vehicle for your resume, which otherwise is considered a high-pressure sales brochure. Resume is a high-pressure sales brochure. I love that. For the many networkers who hate cold calling or who consider a telephone call a form of surprise attack, a letter can seem like a calmer, quieter approach. Indeed. In an age when telemarketing is on the upswing and bombards us with unsolicited calls, robocalls, and requests, a letter may be the best way not to get lumped in with the hucksters selling timeshare condos in the Everglades. Snail mail still works. The problems with the letter are, one, it too may be screened, particularly if it includes a resume. Many secretaries are instructed that any letter containing a resume is to be forwarded to human resources, talent acquisition, or deposited in the round file. Two, even if it's read, there's no pressure for an immediate response. When deciding between a phone call or a letter, ask yourself five basic questions. Five questions. Now, a letter might also be an email or a LinkedIn message with social media. This came out long before social media, so keep that in mind. Number one, how comfortable, succinct, and articulate can I be on the phone, particularly with people I don't know? Um, that's, that's a good point because there are several people who have thick accents that are difficult to understand. I also have coached folks that are deaf, and so they have to use um, other methods to communicate. Two, how great a disparity in age, power, or status is there between me and the contact I want to network with? The greater the disparity, the more appropriate a letter. Three, what form of communication is the contact likely to get more of? Letters or phone calls? 
Choose whichever he gets less of. Don't throw yourself in with all the other lemmings. Four, does my situation require a lot of explaining or involve a complicated chronological sequence of events or contacts? If so, a letter is better. Five, how's my writing ability? Can I compose a direct, candid, well-organized letter without tripping over grammar and syntax or launching something that sounds like a presidential inaugural address? If you're trying to cold call a contact without the benefit of a friend or colleague as a referral, a letter may be a better choice. People tend to erect a set of defenses when a voice on the phone says, Hi, you don't know me, but... In such situations, a letter may seem more respectful, more measured, and less presumptuous. When you're working off the launch pad of proximity referrals, using the phone will allow you to cover more ground in less time with fewer st stamps, and you may try phoning a few networking leads. That's a good point. So you can save a lot of time in this process by setting things up by phone rather than waiting for somebody to respond to a LinkedIn message, an email, uh, a snail mail letter, etc. You might call between 8.30 and 9 a.m. or after 5 p.m. Good point. The times when many people are more likely to pick up their own phones. Monday mornings aren't great. The contact will be trying to wade through the task of setting up the coming week. And late Friday afternoon is irritating. Use the do unto others golden rule when networking. Don't call anyone at a time you would dislike being called. Although, that's the time you most often get them on the phone. Surviving the screen. Be prepared to have your call answered by an experienced professional secretary, administrative assistant, what have you, whose job requirements him or her to be interpreted between you and your desired contact. The phone dialogue might go something like this. Editorial comments are in parentheses. Secretary. Mr. Wellington's office. Hi, Richard Wright calling. Is he in, please? May I ask what this is in reference to? His friend, Fred Ott, strongly suggested I call. I was hoping to ask Mr. Wellington a quick question. I'm sorry, he's away from his desk right now. May I have him call you back? That would be fine. My number is 503-555-1212. You know, I'm going to be in and out of meetings all afternoon, and I'd hate... To catch up him up in a game of phone tag. Besides, I'm not even sure he'd recognize my name. It probably makes more sense for me to try to call him back. Is there a time later this afternoon when I might be able to reach him for a quick call? His calendar looks awfully busy for the rest of the afternoon, Mr. Wright. I'm sorry. Yes, Fred told me Mr. Wellington's a really busy man. And I, didn't, and I don't want to make a pest of myself, but I was hoping to hook up with him in the next day or so. Tell me, is there a time tomorrow morning when it would be convenient for me to try to call? Well, he has an 8.30 meeting, and I expect to run about 10, then an 11 meeting downtown. If I try to reach him about 10.15, would that make sense? Well, yes, you could try that. Fine, I'll call then. I appreciate your help. Oh, may I ask your name. That's wonderful. Ask her name. Absolutely. My name is Mrs. Carmody. Thanks again for your help. I'll call tomorrow around 1015. The following morning at the agreed upon time. Good morning, Mrs. Carmody. It's Richard Wright again. How are you doing for getting to Mr. Wellington? If she tells you that Wellington is in fact unavailable and really will have to call you back, you have no choice but go into passive mode, leave your phone number, and hope that his sense of obligation to his friend, Fred Ott, will carry the day. If you don't hear from Mr. Wellington within several days, you can try one more call to Mrs. Carmody and diplomatically try to regain some control. That might look like this. Mrs. Carmody, this is Richard Wright. I haven't heard from Mr. Wellington. I really don't want to be a nuisance. But as I mentioned when you and I spoke, I was hoping to catch him sometime this week. What's our best step at this point? That way you're kind of being diplomatic but also um, prompting. Okay. The KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid. When you're past Mrs. Carmody and your prospective contact is on the phone 
It's time to throw your pitch, and this is really good. Let's freeze frame your delivery for an instructive run through. The icebreaker, I love this, the icebreaker. You are identifying yourself and your referral source, explaining the purpose of the call, and very important, qualifying the contact that is telling him why he's of potential value and what he's supposed to know. Here's how it goes. Mr. Wellington, Fred Ott suggested I call to see if I might get a little informal advice and counsel from you. Fred tells me you have real expertise in multi-level marketing and have spent a lot of time both investigating who the players are in that industry and developing your own organization. I recently resigned as regional sales manager for Data Specific after they carved up my territories into a crazy quilt. I've decided at age 46 that it's time to think about looking into new and more autonomous approaches to sales and marketing. Fred says your experience and perspective might help save me a lot of wasted time and energy. What I was hoping we might do is sit down for a few minutes at your convenience and chat about multi-level marketing. I'm curious to know where the industry is going and who the reputable organizations are. I'd be welcome to any feedback you could offer, how well my background and skills would translate into the multi-level marketing field. Just an asterisk there, I guess some um, after action review on that interaction. Um, I might not denigrate my employer or even mention my age. So I would probably pick something a little more, you know, a little more polished there. Um, so that's something that I would uh, adjust. Now, after the icebreaker comes the decompression, and this is really good as well. This is one of the most important steps in the process, yet many networkers do it awkwardly or not at all. You must give a sincere reassurance that your request is low stakes and time limited. Because so many black-hearted networkers are guilty of false and deceptive decompression, you may want to consider a double decompression. It looks like this. Let me emphasize that my purpose in asking to meet with you isn't to hit you up for a job. I know that a lot of people are asking for these networking meetings to get in the door, then they go a full court press and ask for employment. I promise I won't do that to you. And wouldn't embarrass Fred Ott by acting inappropriately towards someone he was good enough to refer me to. At this point in my search, I'm trying to gather information and get a clear image of the marketplace. If you know of any specific opportunities, of course, I'd be interested. But I'm not calling with the expectation that you have of no or, or know of any opportunities or openings. It's, it's awesome, strategic, really good. You should do that with every networking interaction, especially if you want to be truthful about your status as a, a job seeker. Scheduling. We noted earlier that face-to-face -face meetings are best if you can get them without being overly aggressive. When you are exerting subtle pressure, the key is to ask about the person's preferences and cast your suggestions in terms of the convenience of the contact. It looks like this. I was hoping we might get together for a short meeting. I see no reason why it should have to go longer than 45 minutes. As for scheduling, it would be completely at your convenience. I could drop in at your office if that's best, meet some place after work, or perhaps hook up for breakfast. What would work best for you? If the contact describes himself as really jammed up right now and suggests that May, 15, May 15th, 1997, let's, let's put 2027, May 15th, 2027, would be a good time to meet, you can both defer and counter press by putting a general time frame around your request. If that's the first time we could meet, uh, we could get together, so be it. But because there is a multi-level marketing conference in St. Louis in three weeks, I was hoping we might squeeze in a quick meeting before then so I can get in better prepared to evaluate what I hear there. I don't want to make a pest of myself, but I would be grateful if I could grab a short stretch of your time before the 23rd. If a timely face-to-face -face meeting just isn't possible, your first fallback position is to ask whether the contact will network on the phone. Don't assume that because the person is on the phone with you, now is the best time to launch into your two-minute drill. Again, ask the contact's preferences. 
Fred told me how busy your schedule is, and I can certainly understand if it isn't possible to meet personally. It would still be very helpful to me if I could have a couple minutes of your time on the phone. Have you time to talk now, or would another time be more convenient for me to call you back? I would switch that up. I'd put the one I want second. Okay, so if I wanted to talk now and I was prepared to talk now, I'd put that second and I'd give it more emphasis. There might be a, I can schedule a time that's more convenient for you or do you have time to talk now? Okay, and we shake our head up and down. Mrs. Carmody one, networker zero. The Mrs. Carmody's of the business world will often succeed in screening you away from their bosses instead of agreeing to set time for you to call back. They will insist, I'll have Mr. Wellington return your call, or worse, I'll give Mr. Wellington your number. If you don't hear back from Mr. Wellington in a couple of days, you can try to follow up a call or two, but don't keep hammering with call after call. Over persistence can be a major turnoff. If you don't hear back from Wellington, try a brief letter that explains who you are and what you want. A networking chase letter. Chase letter. So the networking chase letter looks like this. Dear Mr. Wellington, I'm sorry we've been able to hook up by phone. Let me explain who I am and why I am calling. In a recent conversation with Fred Ott, I mentioned that having resigned from my position as regional sales manager at Data Specific, I'm exploring the multi-level marketing industry. Fred immediately thought of you and mentioned that you had researched the industry carefully before starting your business and are a font of knowledge about trends, pluses, minuses, and industry leaders in multi-level marketing. I was calling to see whether we might arrange at your convenience a brief networking meeting in which I might get your views about the industry and the best approach for someone like me to research a career shift into multi-level marketing. Let me emphasize, as strongly as I can, that my purpose isn't to request employment with your organization, nor do I expect that you know of any particular jobs or openings at this point. Fred suggested that in just an hour of your time, I could learn a lot that would help me target and focus my efforts, get a little exposure, and perhaps come away with some suggestions about other people I would do well to meet. I will follow up shortly by phone to see if we might schedule a time to meet, if it's more convenient for you to give Ms. Carmody some possible meeting times, I'll be pleased to schedule with her and not trouble you further. I very much appreciate your help. Sincerely, Richard Wright. If these approaches don't work, you might try calling Fred Ott back and mentioning that you're having a tough time connecting to Wellington to respond. Fred may choose to uh, use up some of his valuable currency by leaning on Wellington, but you should understand that the renewed pressure may make Wellington a little testy, even if he does eventually agree to see you. If he's a valuable contact, it may be worth the extra effort, risk, and obligation. If Fred agrees to follow up personally and you really owe him a few favors. If all this deft, tactful pressure doesn't pay off, put a big black line through Wellington's name on your networking list. So a couple things about this. Uh, I would be really cautious about overusing a specific person uh, like Fred Ott in this case, where you go back over and over again. But as a standard of practice, I would reach out to somebody one or two times, and if you're not able to connect, I would get back to Fred Ott and say, hey, do you have any suggestions for me? Or is it possible that I might be able to get his mobile number? Would that be okay? And, and try to get their mobile number. Do whatever you can. It's a key piece of information I think we should all be collecting is that mobile number. Conferences, conventions, and meetings. Gatherings of professional associations, fraternal organizations, and community groups are veritable hotbeds of networking leads. Attend as many as you can, grab any and all attendance lists, collect as many business cards as possible, and try to make a sincere contribution. In other words, your networking offers at such gatherings shouldn't look like networking efforts, unless the sole purpose of the organization is to provide an opportunity to develop networking contacts. One of the fastest ways to earn yourself a bad rap as a self-serving weasel is to try to work through a networking meeting agenda, see chapter five, with individuals whom you call her at a conference. Everyone attending a conference is out to maximize his exposure, and if you pin someone in a corner behind the relish tray and monopolize his lunch hour or break time, 
you'll make an enemy. Instead, exchange a few words of introduction, then ask for leave to follow up after the, conversa after the conference. Mr. Wellington, hi, I'm Richard Wright. I don't believe we've met, but Fred Ott has lots of great things to say about your knowledge of multi-level marketing. I recently resigned my position at three, as a regional sales manager with Data Specific, and I'm taking a hard look at multi-level marketing. Look, I don't want to pull you away from the conference and colleagues right now, but would it be okay if I called you after the conference? I really would be grateful if we might arrange an informal networking meeting. Face to face, in public, Wellington is far more likely to say, yeah, sure, give me a call, than to blow you off. He'll then probably forget all about meeting you, but you won't. After the conference, you can proceed with what we call rights revenge. Mrs. Carmody, Mr. Wellington's office. Hi, this is Richard Wright calling. When I was chatting with Mr. Wellington at the conference the other day, he said to give him a call to schedule an appointment. Do you have his calendar handy? Requests by letter. If you decide you'd be more comfortable making your overture by letter, the tone and length suggested in the earlier follow-up letter to Mr. Wellington, minus the reference to attempt to schedule by phone, are appropriate. The letter shouldn't be longer than about two-thirds of a page. Write more and you'd confront the reader with a daunting challenge in just wading through it. There's a common tendency to overwrite networking letters to include too much irrelevant personal detail and try to use the letter as work through uh, letter to work through issues that are proper topics for the meeting itself. So save it for the meeting. Your objective is to get the meeting. About as many letters are too breezy and presumptuous as are too formal. Strive for a direct conversational tone. Use strong topic sentences and action verbs. Everything your English teacher drummed you into you in the seventh grade. Cold call request letter. This is really good too. Dear Ms. Schmidt, I have recently returned to the Chicago area. I was raised in Winnetka and did my undergraduate work in economics at Northwestern from San Francisco, where for the past years I was a director of development for the Bay to Bay Players, a repertory company and artists consortium with a $4 million annual budget. When I mentioned it to a few local acquaintances in Chicago, that I want to move from nonprofit development into private sector entrepreneurial marketing, several promptly mentioned you. It seems that as head of Women's Entrepreneurial Forum, you are well known and highly respected. Yeah, flattery will get you places in the local entrepreneurial venture capital and investment banking communities. I'm writing to in the hope that we might get together for some informal networking. Without intending to en enlist you as a career counselor, I would welcome any thoughts you might have about how to attack this transition. Is it a matter of going back to school, repackaging, repackaging myself, or making some interim move? Because my local network is limited, I also would be most grateful to learn of other entrepreneurs to whom I might introduce myself. I've enclosed a copy of my resume just to give you a better feel for my background. Nowadays, you would probably just put a link to your uh, LinkedIn profile. Let me plan on following up with you in a few days to see if we might arrange an introductory meeting. Thanks very much. Sincerely, Deidre Hubble. Above and beyond the straightforward approach in Deidre's letter, note how she framed the inclusion of her resume. Remember, a resume is a sales brochure, a request for employment, including the resume in your letter may suggest that you're looking for an interview, not a networking meeting. While decompressing her request for some networking, Deidre also decompressed the presence of her resume. Getting contacts to warm up enough to spend time with you isn't a matter of uttering ritual phrases, phrases or magic words. It's a matter of human nature. If you're pleasant, candid, and sensitive to other person's time and priorities, you'll get most of the meetings you want however and wherever requested. Then the real fun begins. That's chapter four. Chapter five we'll pick up next week. It's titled, What Goes On in a Networking Meeting? So we're actually gonna talk then about what the networking meeting should be structured as. So let's see if we have any questions here that I can answer. If you want, go ahead and share this broadcast with your network, whether that's on LinkedIn, Periscope, uh, the Facebook group, 
or YouTube. Uh, share it with your networking connections uh, or your social channels. Um, so let's see what kind of questions we have here. Uh, good. We got some uh, project managers in the house. That's great. Awesome. Yeah, share your needs in the chat and network with each other, please. Especially if you're in a similar domain or geography, I think that's perfectly valid. Uh, go ahead and include whatever titles you're seeking. Uh, and if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat right now. I'd be happy to answer. Okay. Looks like we have some folks, uh, SLC, UT, IT project managers. Hmm. Uh, what is UT? I'm not familiar with that. University of Texas, uh, SLC, Salt Lake City, I'm assuming. Uh, Ken, welcome. Ooh, yeah, um, looks like you're in medical records. Take a look at, uh, um, I think there's an organization called HIMSS, H-I-M-S-S. -S. They do a lot of work with folks in IT, uh, specifically in healthcare. So if you're in healthcare IT, HIMSS is a great association, which is what we kind of talked about today, is identifying associations that would be perfectly valid uh, for you to interact with. Uh, I found that if you're going to go to an association or a group event or a conference, this is a great chance for you to volunteer. Uh, I had people, um, cl clients that I was coaching in software development that went to a, a Microsoft event in Redmond, um, showed up unannounced, uh, but asked to volunteer. Uh, excuse me. So they didn't show up unannounced. They reached out to the organizer of the event and asked to volunteer, and they said yes. And they ended up going to lunch with a bunch of people from there, from there, and um, he ended up getting some interviews out of it. So there is, there is hope when you go to a group event or, or a conference of some kind that if you can't afford to to pay, then do your very best to get with the organizer and see if you can volunteer. The best role at that is the person that hands out the badges and like the welcome packets. So if you could be at the front table checking people in giving them their badge. You can see where they work and what their name is. You can introduce yourself um, and offer some options on where to have lunch and, and see if you can tag along. So I think there's a lot of value in that. Good. Thanks for uh, letting me know that UT is Utah. Uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, it looks like. IT project manager. Okay, good. Uh, we've got, I don't know what, what is Karar? I don't know if he's still on the line here. We've got uh, a handful of people here. But if you have any questions, go ahead and leave them in the chat. Use the hashtag career happy hour, and I'll come back and um, take a look at those and answer any questions you might have. Uh, and I hope you all have a great weekend. Um, happy to support your success in any way possible. Share this recording with anybody you know might find value in the series. Pick up the book. This is Book Club. Uh, again, one of the best networking books that I've run across on how to do the networking, not just uh, that you should network, but how to network. Okay. Great. Thanks for coming and being here and uh, uh, being part of the effort to get this book, which is out of print, out there in the community as maybe an audio book option. I do appreciate your patience. Uh, you can also send me a private message if you have any questions. Um, there's also a chance, if you go to my profile on LinkedIn, uh, you can actually schedule um, a 15-minute session with me. It's absolutely free. Happy to do that. So take care, everybody. Happy networking.